Hello Internet, in today's video I'm looking to do a deep dive into the overhaul that Zoroastrian Fates received in Crusader Kings 3 Legacy of Persia. If you played as an Iranian ruler before the update, you may have noticed these changes going in uh, to Legacy of Persia. If not, I'm hoping this video can pique your interest to give it a try because there are a lot of cool things to be experienced here. Um, I'll go over the list of um, all eight different Zoroastrian uh, fates that exist in game. Um, I'll, we'll just go by the order that they appear on the list, which uh, I believe is the number of counties that follow this fate at the 867 start. Uh, my suggestion would be to pick one that. Um, enables you to play the game the way you like it, uh, mainly shaped by the tenants that they have rather than like who has the largest number of county followers and you can always get your uh, realm to convert to the faith you're uh, practicing yourself, that's not the biggest deal. Um, so first off on the list we have Mazdaia Esna um, which is topped in, I believe, to represent the most uh, orthodox uh, version of Zoroastrianism. Uh, State-sanctioned Zoroastrianism sponsored by the late Sasanian Empire, um, which obviously is not present in game because um, it had already disappeared, but uh, its uh, influence um, lives on obviously um, this is partly reflected in game by an interesting doctrine uh, referred to as Behtin versus Khoramdin um, this tries to convey the fact that obviously some Zoroastrian fates were uh, kind of claiming to be the more orthodox variations, whereas others were kind of uh, labeled as like heretics, outcasts, for essentially um, being revisionist, if you will, or like um, trying to introduce uh, new practices uh, into the faith. The description being self explanatory, essentially, Behtin uh, fates referring to themselves as mainline Zoroastrianism, uh, whereas um, Khorandin religions being uh, labeled as uh, heretics, outcasts uh, by Behtin um, fates. Um, it's, it's nice to see uh, traces of um, real history reflected in game like this. Uh, this is a theme that will come across a few t uh, times. Uh, in this video. Uh, before I digress further though, uh, getting back to uh, reviewing the Mazda Yasna religion, um, even though I'm a native Persian speaker, I'm not entirely sure uh, what the pronunciation here is. Uh, I'm guessing this is a Middle Persian or Pahlavi word, uh, something along the lines of Khedoda. Uh, it refers to and the tenant where um, if you're marrying a close family member um, you get a, the same faith vassal opinion boost and monogamous marriages with close family also give you um, a piety boost um, and this makes pure blood a virtue um, the second tenant the ritual celebrations um, gives you piety when you host the feast and your vassals are more likely to uh, attend your feast. Um, this also gives you a flat out vassal opinion and a courtier opinion boost. And lastly, we have sky burials. Um, this uh, really only comes into play uh, after a succession has taken place in game because it requires you to like. Um, essentially give your predecessor a sky burial uh, and receive a piety and vassal opinion uh, reward uh, as a result. Uh, I think this is 
something that was added in uh, Legacy of Persia. It's a new duchy building uh, named the Great Tower of Silence. And this again um, refers to a real uh, historical practice of ancient Zoroastrianism um, regarding uh, burial. Um, and uh, it's nice to see these things uh, kind of historically accurate and uh, represented uh, in the game. Um, in terms of other main doctrines, we went over the Ehtim versus Khorem uh, uh, families, and we have male dominated righteous, theocratic, and pilgrimage encouraged. Uh, in terms of marriage doctrine, uh, it's uh, one spouse, three concubines and uh, divorce if approved is allowed and um, in terms of clergy doctrine uh, we have control and uh, the appointment would be for life and uh, this is something that most of his faith have in common so you should kind of uh, strive to be on your realm priest's uh, good side or uh, you know, get rid of them in Crusader King's fashion <laughs> because you can't really fire them. Next on the list uh, we have Hormazdism and this refers to the Central Asian um, Zoroastrian faith uh, in the you know Sogdian uh, as it's referred to in the Sogdian um, variation of uh, Zoroastrianism uh, and uh, it's also a Behdin religion. Um, four of these um, Zoroastrian faiths are Behdin for Khoramdin. Uh, the Behdins are Mazda Yasna, Khormazdism, um, Geomartism, and Arabic religion. And uh, Khoramdins uh, are Khoramism, uh, Afridunism, Dalfaridism and Nasdaqism. Back to the one at hand, uh, we have a first tenant which is adaptive. This is always nice to have uh, as a religious minority. Uh, if you choose to play as a Zoroastrian ruler, almost always uh, no other ruler uh, or like at least independent uh, ruler or top liege um, will be following Zoroastrianism. And so it's nice to get a different opinion faith boost um, you have it in the form of uh, opinion of different uh, faith liege uh, different faith liege um, opinion and also different faith popular opinion referring to the counties you also get a conversion resistance boost uh, and vassals being less likely to join independence factions uh, next up we have Ancestor Worship, uh, which gives you prestige from level of splendor for newborns um, and also prestige from level of splendor when you get married and uh, it also increases the cap on long reign uh, you know, um, opinion boost and um, characters of the faith having additional bonus uh, when they come to the pilgrimage. Uh, also, flat out close family opinion boost, sky burials we went over. Uh, this is, uh, in terms of main doctrine, the only difference is that uh, it's a pluralist religion uh, instead of um, uh, righteous. And uh, everything else is similar to Mazda, yes, no. Um, yeah. Moving on to the first uh, Khoram Din religion. Um, this is Khoramism. Uh, it actually um, is usually associated with a famous um, rebellion uh, in Iran, um, rebellion of Babai Khoram Din, uh, which was um, essentially um, opposing the caliph, uh, the Abbasid caliph at the time and their stronghold in Azerbaijan, uh, modern-day Azerbaijan province of Iran in uh, northwestern Iran. Um, they actually managed to successfully resist um, 
the caliph's uh, incursions for a pretty substantial amount of time um, and uh, they kind of have a continuous you know um, relevance in um, Iranian mythology because of it um, and uh, it's interesting um, in the sense that um, it was a religion where a few different influences um, kind of came into confluence and uh, that was um, it was a religion that mixed uh, local folk tradition uh, principles of Zoroastrianism, like I guess the more like state sanctioned, like uh, Orthodox Zoroastrianism, together with um, tenets from uh, the movement of Mazdaq, or we'll get to this religion, Mazdaqism later, but uh, uh, essentially it, it was a mixture of different uh, faiths at the time. Uh, for people of uh, this geography. Uh, it has pretty uh, interesting tenants, impactful tenants. First one being uh, Rajas Rebellion, uh, members of Kerojik and uh, Saras Commanders, and uh, you just get a flat out uh, prowess boost and faith hostility advantage boost. As I said, um, you will be a religious minority playing as um, as a Eastern ruler. So uh, essentially, every battle you get in will be a, a different fate battle. So like the fate hostility advantage is pretty useful to have. Next tenant is uh, Raja, uh, and it's uh, there. Um, Basically, it's random, and your newborns get a chance to be considered the reincarnation of an ancestor, uh, which gi gives them, I think, a trait that gives them piety and opinion boosts um, in their life. And um, uh, next up, it's uh, communal possessions. Again, we see uh, some traces of uh, real history here. Um, as you can see, the Mazdaqism region also has this tenant and you see the influence that it had on uh, Horamism being um, uh, shown as a tenant, which is nice to see. And uh, what it actually means is that um, you get a piety reward, um, sending gifts um, and giving away kind of artifacts and uh, you get a piety reward if you marry lowborn characters early game if you don't have uh, a lot of um, marriage alliance options available to you this is obviously nice to have uh, free piety for you uh, makes peasant leader a virtue makes arrogant sin and uh, the flat out um, modifiers are building construction uh, cost discount and a popular opinion boost uh, but the debuff is uh, on control growth um, and there there's a famous uh, scholarly debate in the 20th century where obviously in the shadow of the cold war era uh, sort of thinking um, scholars uh, of uh, you know ancient history sometimes refer to uh, Mazdaqism and kind of by extension other Khoramdin uh, Zoroastrian faiths like uh, the Khoramism kind of proto-socialist or like proto-communist in a way and um, that's kind of been ongoing uh, less so in the 21st century but it was a kind of hot topic uh, whenever the Cold War <laughs> wasn't going, like uh, calling these uh, religions like ancient communists uh, or the sort, uh, because they just had like you know more um, communal possessions at the end of the day, uh, nothing crazy. But um, what interests me uh, particularly uh, about this uh, Zoroastrian faith 
um, apart from the tenants is that it gives you the gender um, law of equality, essentially like an equal gender law. And um, it's, it's um, great for if you're playing for, uh, you know, uh, and a role play uh, playthrough and uh, you want to have that uh, boost, you don't have to like, create a new fate from scratch. Uh, there are two of them, uh, Choramism and Mazakism, that have the equal gender um, doctrine. And it's, uh, it always makes for a really nice playthrough where you don't have to like ignore half your children or population and can uh, grant titles to all your um, children and this is also a pluralist religion and um, the marriage doctrine being monogamous uh, the first uh, real downside to playing um, as Choramism um, is a kind of harsh divorce uh, doctrine which is just like flat out uh, disallowed and um, as you can see the words are pretty self-explanatory vows of marriage being final and binding and the way the only way out of it essentially being the death um, doing you apart clause um, obviously this is Crusader Kings 3, so like random events can happen that uh, say like your spouse suddenly uh, becomes infirm or like um, is uh, you know injured and kind of not able to uh, carry their uh, counselory duties. Uh, especially like I tend to uh, go for high stewardship uh, spouses just to get the domain limit uh, boost from it and in other cases you, you might just be kind of stuck in a marriage where your spouse hates you and yeah that's still probably one of the only downsides of uh, going with Choramism uh, is the marriage doctrine there and um, the clergy doctrine uh, again being control uh, clerical gender either because it's an equal gender faith and um, that's the first of the Horam Din religions we've reviewed um, next up is Afridunism and uh, this is probably my uh, favorite uh, Zoroastrian faith to play in Legacy of Persia I'll get to why in a second um, but before I do um, this is a good segue into mentioning um, three particular Zoroastrian faiths that have the syncretic tenant. Um, the first one is Afridunism, which has the syncretic folk traditions. Next one being Islamic syncreticism for Behafaridism. And the last one being the Aravardic faith, um, which is Christian syncretic. Um, and uh, I think these three religions um, by virtue of having the syncretic tenant um, probably have the most impact on your gameplay uh, they synergize well um, with uh, playing in a region where you're the religious minority you really need the, all the help you can get uh, at the end of the day uh, in terms of boosting the opinion of your neighbors uh, to not try to conquer and wipe you off the map. Um, why I think the Afridunis religion in particular is the most interesting one um, is because of uh, this thread, uh, this tenet, um, which um, considers any unreformed faith anywhere in the world uh, to be hostile instead of evil. Uh, at first glance, uh, this might not seem that important, um, but um, one way in which um, this is um, game changing is that it synergizes with a mechanic introduced in Legacy of Persia um, called uh, Sponsored Conquest, uh, or the interaction name, which is Request Incursion. Uh, what it means is that for 
rulers that are involved in the Iranian intermezzo struggle, there's a new interaction added where, like, you can request a neighboring uh, Turkic warlord, essentially from the steppe region, um, to attack and uh, essentially take land from your neighbors and uh, you can sponsor these uh, incursions uh, and you can set different goals for them um, you can go over it maybe in a later video uh, why it's important is that over the course of your playthrough um, you will notice that uh, a lot of independent polities start popping up on the map essentially uh, breaking away from uh, the larger polities. Um, this is uh, in part uh, because I think the men, uh, men at arms for Turkic rulers, um, you can see here, uh, let me go with one that actually, yeah, the, the horse archers are actually like, busted as men at, men at arms. Like, even if uh, the number of uh, like levies they have is not that high these uh, Turkic warlords or rulers uh, when they're sponsored and they uh, carry out incursions it's almost always successful even if they're punching above their weight so like the Safarid um, kingdom here uh, it's, it's a pretty big chunk of land right uh, but it easily loses to like a smaller um, Turkic warlord if they're like kind of a sponsor to attack them. So they're pretty strong and over the course of your um, playthrough you will see the rulers of like smaller breakaway uh, polities actually uh, belonging to unreformed fates, mainly the Tangri, the Khuzerite, and later on, if your diplomatic range extends, for example, you conquer land here on the southern part of the Iranian plateau, on the Persian Gulf or whatever, um, your diplomatic range when it's uh, extended, uh, even African unreformed faiths like the Volgi or the Kushites, all of these um, uh, faiths and rulers who adhere to them uh, are essentially um, potential allies uh, because um, when you uh, start off they actually have a positive opinion of you they don't consider your fate evil uh, you're only hostile to them and um, in my previous video I did a self-imposed uh, kind of hard playthrough where I started off as the ruler of Gilan the smallest, uh, you know, weakest independent policy that starts off as uh, involved in the Iranian intermezzo struggle um, and I use the ruler creator to kind of um, go with uh, a ruler whose faith is uh, Afridunist it would be historically accurate you'd, you'd ruler have the same faith as your um, subjects essentially and I had so much fun in this playthrough mainly because of this synergy that exists between the game mechanic of sponsored conquest and the effects of it that you'll see and uh, i believe the devs actually mentioned that they added this to um, kind of almost um, simulate uh, real historical um, trends of the time uh, whereby the Iranian plateau was actually constantly uh, under attack from um, uh, Turkic tribes either from uh, Central Asia or kind of the Russian um, arena in the north and in my playthrough as the ruler of Gilan um, if you're interested uh, the video is on my channel my first video um, I actually was pretty proximate to a lot of um, unreformed faith rulers uh, whether it's the Khuzerite or the Tangri and um, and so I right off the bat when I started uh, ally marriage alliances were available to me that would not otherwise be 
um, if uh, my faith didn't have uh, the syncretic folk traditions and um, so that's why i think it's very fun and impactful and uh, i don't think you're gonna regret it especially playing as afridunis because of the heavily featured um, turkic uh, rulers that will eventually start taking land in the iranian region um, the other tenants being Varys Rebellion, we already covered that um, when we went over the Choramism and Ritual Hospitality where you can have an honored guest um, that uh, where you especially, uh, essentially expand piety and get uh, increased opinion for that honored guest also makes generous of your true callous as seen uh, and per powerful vessel that is on your council you also get a flat uh, piety boost um, in terms of other doctrine um, it's male dominated pluralist theocratic cards pilgrimage um, again coming back to the only downside of playing similar to choramism afridunism also has the disallowed uh, divorce doctrine pretty harsh not the end of the world you can still play just something to keep in mind uh, if you're not used to it and you like click on your spouse and see like that option grayed out um, i guess over the course of the playthrough we'll eventually get used to that clerical gender is either clerical function is control um, and yeah that's the first of our syncretic zoroastrian fates Next up, we have Behafaridism. Um, I'm not entirely sure if um, Behafarid is a real historical figure, but from the description, uh, it seems like um, it's referring to a person, a Zoroastrian clergy member, who kind of tried to gap, uh, bridge the gap between uh, Islam and Zoroastrianism. Uh, again, coming back to the theme of trying to uh, represent real um, history in game uh, with at least some measure of accuracy. Um, apart from the fact that whether Bahafari was um, a, a Zoroastrian monk, as it kind of uh, alludes to or not, uh, it does. Um, but the mere existence of uh, this faith. Um, is an interesting kind of reminder that uh, the religious conversion of um, previously uh, held uh, geographies under the Sasanian Empire um, from Zoroastrianism to Islam wasn't overnight. It wasn't um, even sometimes like uh, popular. Um, history uh, you know popular history not like scholarly history um, in modern iran um, the kind of uh, popularly held uh, belief is that you know iran uh, ancient iran the kind of sasanian empire lands uh, or domains were kind of conquered by um, an invading you know um, Muslim army or like uh, Muslim tribes and like everybody was uh, converted to Islam by force the mere fact that um, a kind of syncretic uh, faith like this exists um, does allude to the fact that uh, the process of uh, conversion in these lands to Islam was very slow it actually took um, a few centuries um, for the peasantry to actually convert uh, and then they did uh, like quote unquote convert to islam they would carry um, you know uh, beliefs with them that had its roots in zoroastrianism they would mix and match kind of like uh, zoroastrian folk and like Islamic um, beliefs at the same time um, and it's really nice to see uh, kind of like a faith like this represented which essentially tries to 
bridge the gap between like doctrines of Zoroastrianism and Islam and make them compatible, make them not be antithetical to each other. Um, and same thing kind of uh, goes for Afridunism, where uh, it's kind of like a mix of uh, folk traditions uh, that you know, like the animist uh, type of like um, early, like more primitive religions uh, with Zoroastrianism in northern Iran. Again, kind of um, has its at least roots in some measure of historical accuracy. I'm not sure, like, if you can really argue for uh, the inhabitants of you know uh, modern day Gilan and Mazandaran provinces of uh, Iran. Um, having uh, a very distinct um, faith that differed with those uh, in the uh, Khoramism stronghold, as I referred to like earlier, the uprising uh, led by Babak Khoramdin. Um, but yeah, it's nice to at least see an um, effort uh, by the devs to kind of uh, showcase some of these things. And um, back to reviewing the tenants for Baha'i Thayridism, we have uh, Raja that we went over before, Sky Burials, and the most important one being Islamic Syncretism. Uh, out of the eight faiths um, that we have under the family of Zoroastrianism, I would say Baha'i Thayridism is probably the easiest pick because most of your neighbors are Muslim and if they have a more lenient opinion of you the easier time you're gonna have uh, and it also uh, gives you the polygamous marriage type which allows you to have up to four marriage alliances obviously better than just one um, so those two things i think make it an easy pick if you're trying to go for a less challenging experience um, the only other um, Zoroastrian faith that has the polygamous marriage type is Mazdaqism um, it's like very different in terms of other uh, tenants but just worth mentioning and um, also more lenient um, divorce doctrine and um, there's a one difference where the clerical function is alms and pacification in, in, instead of control uh, all other ones we covered so far were control uh, and yeah that's um, I think the main takeaways for Bahafaridism uh, next up uh, we have Geomartinianism <laughs> Geomartinianism <laughs> it's funny when you try to like uh, mix um, ism with uh, like Persian uh, roots or Persian words. I think the new Persian or like modern day Persian uh, name that it's trying to refer to is Kiyomars or Geyomars, and then there's an ism at the end. The, Let's try again this time. Hopefully we can do it. Geo Martinianism. Yeah, Geo Martianism. Geo Martianism. Yeah, we did it. Geo Martianism. <laughs> Essentially, like it's Geo Mart and then whatever to make it a uh, religion name. Um, and this is, um, I think. Um, the third Behtin uh, religion that we're gonna cover. So we had Mazdayasna, or Mazdism, uh, Geomartianism, and uh, the Arab Wardic religion, which all were part of the Behtin family. Then we had Khoramism, Afridunism, Behafaridism, and Mazdaqism uh, that were from the family of Khoramdin. Uh, I actually might have forgotten to mention what these modifiers are. They're not that important. Um, the fellow Behdin fa uh, fates, the four of them, they consider each other to be stray instead of hostile. 
uh, I believe. Uh, but obviously they consider the Koram Din phase to be hostile. Um, and the Koram Din phase, they have a different modifier, which is they get a advantage against co-religionists. This is again not impactful because you won't be fighting a lot of other Zoroastrian rulers. Essentially none other exists uh, if you go for it. Um, it's really like in Legacy of Persia, there's only uh, Rostam and Baba Andi here. Um, that he kind of has a, if I'm not mistaken, this guy has a secret whereby he's like secretly a Zoroastrian practitioner or something like that. It was, uh, I guess, the best way to give you a way to play a Zoroastrian ruler without using the ruler creator. I almost always use the ruler creator myself, but uh, yeah, it's nice to have that. And uh, back to reviewing the tenants here. Um, Divination um, is the only new one we've covered. Ritual celebrations and sky burials before gives you a naval speed boost. Um, otherwise, pretty standard, not much to mention here. Probably wouldn't pick this one myself. There are more interesting playthroughs to be had with other fates, and uh, that's a good segue to Mazdakism. I guess uh, this would be one of the more interesting picks you could have. Uh, both because uh, it's uh, one of the only two um, fates that allows you to have the polygamous marriage type. Uh, it's honestly early game if you're starting out as a smaller ruler. Like having four marriage alliances is really good, better than one. Um, and also it has the equal uh, gender doctrine. Which is, in my opinion, always uh, nice to have uh, in your playthroughs. Um, and tenants, these are actually interesting tenants. Gnosticism. Um, this means that you consider other Gnostic or dualist fates uh, to be righteous instead of um, hostile or evil. Um, from top of my mind, I'm not sure how many other. Uh, Gnostic or dualist fates are around you in terms of like proximity to you uh, like in terms of like your diplomatic range reaching those rulers um, let's actually check um, yeah Mahayana is an I think the Manichaeism or Manichaean fate this is a dualist fate um, yeah, it might have less of an effect than the three syncretic fades that we uh, covered, but it's nice to have better than nothing to be honest. My quibble would be with this part where you get a store chip debuff uh, and get a learning buff. Not my favorite, but you can live with it at the end of the day so makes temperate a virtue and glutinous a sin um, pacifism you know it's it's not the best talent to have but it at least gives you a domain limit boost uh, you can't declare holy bars um, but one thing I mentioned is that if you're playing as a Zoroastrian ruler and you declare a holy bar on a Muslim ruler um, you kind of have to be prepared that a lot of more powerful uh, neighboring uh, Muslim rulers might join that far. So it is a risky move uh, as a religious minority to declare uh, Holy Bar. I personally do it all the time in my playthroughs, but there's always that off chance where things go uh, awry, kind of uh, not the way you anticipate it. So, Actually, as a Zoroastrian player, probably not the uh, end of the world for you to be pacifist. Uh, communal possessions, it has that in common with uh, Khoramism. 
um, and we covered that in the past. Uh, equal, pluralist, um, polygamous, divorces, you know, the divorce doctrine is actually better, like more lenient than uh, Horanism. Well, obviously you don't get the other two tenets. And yeah, that's pretty much, I think, the takeaway for this faith. And lastly, last but, n but not least, the Arabic faith, which is a very interesting one, um, especially if you want to play a more uh, Byzantine centric playthrough and like kind of, um, you know, ally yourself with the Christian world, the Christian dome. Um, this is this makes for a very um, interesting playthrough in my opinion um, because it's uh, obviously Christian syncretic um, and uh, yeah it opens up a whole uh, avenue of potential alliances for you that wouldn't be available to you otherwise same with Afridunism and Bahafaridism communal identity is an interesting tenant uh, it's a two-way buff um, whereby um, if a county has the same faith as you the promote culture speed there gets a buff uh, and if a county has the same culture as you the promote faith there gets a buff um, but a conversion uh, speed in countries of different culture is uh, like debuffed essentially you also get a flat out same fate of him uh, sanction false conversions uh, gives you conversion resistance and sometimes uh, you know characters or counties revert back to the fate uh, that they had previously uh, which is Arab word religion and um, monthly intrigue lifestyle experience boost uh, otherwise, it's male-dominated, pluralist, theocratic. Um, divorce is more lenient than the ones that disallowed it. A marriage type is um, one spouse, three concubines. And clerical control, function is control. Actually, like that, um, I think the only faith that has a different clerical function is Bahafarism, which has alms and pacification. Uh, every other faith has control, which is good. Yeah, with that said, that completes our deep dive of all eight Zoroastrian faiths that were reworked, overhauled in Crusader Kings Tree Legacy of Persia. Um, as I said uh, during my video, uh, in my previous video, I went through a self-imposed torture challenge where I started as a ruler of Gilan and uh, tried to unlock two rare achievements, one of them Iranian revival, which like you end the Iranian intermezzo struggle, essentially being a character of Iranian faith, and secondly Darius's revenge which, so like I started as a ruler of Gilan here is tiny one county polity and you hold the entirety of Persian Empire which you get the title if you make the uh, Iranian resurgence uh, or the like Iranian revival achievement a decision uh, you hold this as well as two kingdom titles uh, Thessalonica and Hellas um, if you're interested in seeing that you can find it on my channel. I sincerely hope you enjoyed this video and um, hope to see you in future ones. If you have any suggestions, please let me know in the comments and hope you enjoyed it.